I'm a park ranger for a state park in the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I was working one day and something I've never seen before stared me down as I was hiking to a remote campsite. I've never seen a deer act like they did. They were terrified, unlike anything I've seen in behavior. I have seen coyotes and even bear, but this was something different. I've heard the term dogman before reading this, and after speaking to a fellow Native American friend, he said he had heard of similar creatures. I have to say that the incident, I have been followed a couple of times. I'm only writing this to you because my father said that I will be helped by reaching out to somebody who knows what they're talking about. I have vowed to carry a weapon with me every time I go out, even on personal occasion. If you decide to read this, maybe your audience can offer some advice. I am a fire park ranger in Alberta, Canada. This will be a series of events that happened to me over the past five years of service. This isn't normal for me to write my feelings online. But someone close to me said that I should try. I already have a lot of trouble explaining what happened, so please bear with me. I've been a fan of no sleep for the past five years. Basically, since the first night shift I took here in the watchtower. My job is simple. I either sit in the weather tower or the watchtower. Either way, I spend my day watching one of the most beautiful views one can see. Mountains, lakes, and miles and miles of forest. During the night, it's like being in space. I can't see anything except the stars and the moon shining through the tower. My tasks are to respond to problems nearby the tower, day or night, and watch for any signs of smoke. I am trained to respond to service call or wolf call, deploy and investigate alone. I prefer working nights, if you ask me. Something with the way things are during the night makes me want to just sit down and relax. That's when I started reading stories on Nosley. At first it made me a little uneasy with where I was since I work alone in a tower that moves a little every time the wind blows. Every time the tower shakes, it feels like someone is climbing up the ladder. I lost count of the nights that I sat right next to the entrance door, paranoid. After a while, I got used to the ambiance, and I got really comfortable with my work, maybe a little too much. This blog will tell you stories in a series of posts of my most awkward and weird events that happened to me in the past five years. So ladies and gentlemen, sit tight, hold onto your beer or coffee, and be prepared to be entertained in the most terrifying way possible. Uh, a bit too much. March 17th, 2015 10.45 p.m. My shift starts usually at 10.30, but that night I was a little late. I had already called in to tell them I'd be a couple of minutes late, so I wasn't really rushing to get there. To get to my tower, I have to drive a good 20 minutes in a dense forest at maybe 20 kilometers an hour. Then I'd find a parking and walk 10 minutes in a little path that would bring me to the tower. Not scary at all if you are a trained ranger. As I was walking down the path, I didn't use my flashlight since the full moon was at its full peak. I could see very well, and I decided to put on my earphones and listen to some rush. The path brought me the uh, cliff full of wet and small oak trees. When you're walking up the cliff, you can see the weather tower at the top of it, so I didn't have much to walk left to get to my position. As I was scrolling down my iTunes lists, I had this weird feeling in my head. You know the feeling that you are being watched. I actually thought there was something since my area was full of mountain lions and other cute but dangerous creatures. So I decided to pick up the pace and try to get there without getting hunted down by some big cat. Now at a certain point when you're approaching the tower's territory, some light stick starts lighting up to show you the right path to the right tower. I was going to the weather tower, so I followed the right path. The lights are activated with a motion detector, so when I passed one, two couple of lights ahead will light up. That's when I saw something weird a couple meters down the path, not an even 30 feet from the gate. The light were turning on and, and off, as if someone was ahead of me. I stopped and took off my earplugs and I yelled, uh, Yo, 
Who's there? Nothing. The lights turned off. I shrugged it off, thinking it was maybe a small animal or something. I walked maybe five or six meters, and the lights at the gate turned on again. Standing in front of the gate, a man. At least from where I was looking, it looked like a guy. I couldn't tell if it was one, the uh, guys from the tower, but there was a guy standing in front of the gate. I stopped again, annoyed and confused. I yelled loudly, Hey man, this is private property. Do you work here? Lights turned off again. Now I was getting spooked a little. I decided to pick up my radio and call in my station. But the radio obviously was dead. As I was about to start walking again, the lights turned on again, and the man was walking up the stairs leading to the entrance of the weather tower. I started running like crazy to try and caught up with him. At that point, I was dead set on talking to the guy. I got to the tower finally, assuming the guy was inside with my co-workers. Since there's like five minutes between him getting inside and me getting at the bottom of the stairs, I would have saw him climb down in between, for sure. I was about to open the door to enter the tower, and I looked behind me because of the same feeling I had earlier. Convincing myself I was reading too much of no sleep at night, I entered. Hey man, sorry I'm late. Where the guy? My co-workers looked at me confused. What guy? I've been alone since you left this morning. So I'm either going crazy or I actually saw someone and he magically went down the staircase without me noticing it. Either way, that night I was not on a weather watch. December 15th, 2015. Eastern Tower, 6.10 p.m. Eastern Tower to North Tower. Please acknowledge my checkup call over. That evening was one for the ages. Big snowstorm mixed with some violent wind. I tried to communicate with the Northern Tower since my shift started that morning. I eventually was able to pick up a small but brief okay from them at 10 a.m. Normally, we have to call in every two hours to check if everything is going well in our respective area. The Northern Tower would always initiate the call by saying, Northern Tower to Eastern Tower, good morning. Everything is pretty boring up in here and we wish you a disastrous day over... I would normally reply in fashion, but that day was not like any other day. Something felt off about the storm, mostly because it came out of nowhere. My radar was showing a nice winter blue sky for the entire day. After their short answer, it seemed like the storm was picking up intensively, which was the reason with my communication problem with the other tower. Mainly the reasons that nothing was working on that day, too. Statics in communications, power bump, power shortage, and the Wi-Fi was not working properly. Since I could not reach the tower and I had nothing to do for the next four hours, I decided to go in the back room to lay down for a while. I would eventually have to wake up before my replacement comes, so I've set an alarm for 6 p.m. Something about the peaceful sound of the wind made it easy to simply drift away and sleep. The alarm I have saved was turned off when I woke up. The sound of static was loud in the console. Someone was trying to reach me by radio communication. East Tower. This is North Tower. Can you repeat your last message? Over. I awkwardly got up, stumbled on my winter boots to finally reach the console. Something was off. I felt something weird inside. Almost as if someone just left the room. But why would they say this? What last message? I slept for nearly three hours and I uh, never got up to pee. Even more to go play radio with the tower up north. I didn't want it to sound too tired on the mic, so I gave myself a couple of slap on my face to try and wake me up a little bit more. With the most obvious as I just woke up voice, I replied. North Tower, this is East Tower. I didn't send any call for the past four hours. Over... Nothing, only static. Again, I was thanking damn nature for the pain in the ass day I was having. Eventually, I had no choice to start a malfunction report due to the lack of communication. I hated those reports, probably because I'm a little too much of a lazy person. Coffee in hand, I was sipping and writing my way through my report when the tower lost power. It was pitch black inside. 
My anxiety reached an all-time high when I could not find any working flashlights. Enraged by the temperature outside, I stumbled around the console trying to look for a potential light source. That's when it happened. A weird clicking sound right next to me coming from inside the radio monitor. The light from the monitor started to open on and off until the radio completely turned on. The sound of static coming out of the thing started to amplify more and more until I succeeded and unplugged the monitor. No power and the radio was working. What the hell? My heart was still racing after ten minutes of me, trying to figure out why, with no poir, can a radio turn on. I sat on the main chair and closed my eyes for a moment. I was feeling myself relaxing, the wind blowing on the tour, the snow colliding on the windows. Everything of this place was made to make a man fall asleep. East Tower, help is on the way. Please stay still, over. I jumped the F out off the chair. Chills were going down my spine. No freaking power nor connection to a power source. I reached down for the microphone, sweating due to an extreme nope situation I was having. Realizing mid-through that the voice was not the same as I remember, it was already too late. I replied briefly, Who's this? I've waited a couple of minutes for an answer. I was getting angry at that point. I grabbed the microphone and I yelled, Who the F is this? What's going on? What's? The communication was cut short. The power was restored miraculously. I plugged in the monitor and started to make a distress call to the Northern Tower. I was freaked out all right. Oh, Northern Tower, this is Ute. Eastern Tower. Did you just call me five minutes ago? Over. And his answer was to this day, the moment when my third eye opened widely, he said. Eastern Tower. Where the hell were you? I tried calling you for the past three days. And I replied, I'm fine. I tried to call you since my shift started seven out. What do you mean three days? You've been MIA. For the past three days, SR teams are all over the place. You've placed a distress signal from far up west. Reality can be tricky sometimes. When you work too much and are secluded in one place for a long period of time, you can lose your path a little. But to me, I never lost myself. I fell asleep three hours ago to wake three days later. Naked, in a console looking outside the window. The beautiful blue summer sky. No clouds in the area, only the beautiful sight of nature of the Canadian wilderness. Birds were singing that morning, and I could see. Wait, where's the snow? It's, it's December. When I was around 17, 18, some friends invited me to a hunting, fishing, or camping kind of thing. I rarely went so far north in my country, so I agreed, despite not having anything to do with this kind of stuff. I feel like I have to say I'm from Moldova, Eastern Europe. Those woods connect with Romania and Ukraine, at least they did back in the day. I'm 28 now. A huge forest, even experienced hunters get lost sometimes. I also have to add that our hunters don't have trails made specifically for them. No trail... No camps made for tourists or hunters. Not nothing. It's pure mother nature in you. We do have tourist spots, but they never go really far. We must have walked two, three hours before we even found the spot. We camped there, and after a while, we went deeper. After four hours, we picked up signs that there is a boar somewhere. We went after it and even split when someone saw fox signs around. I went with three others after the fox. We went towards, and I even saw from afar, but something scared it, and it went in a different location, very fast. We also noticed some movement. The location is higher than us, and for some reason, we decided to go there. At first, we thought it's other hunters, but soon enough, we understood it's something else. We found the spot, but no one was there. Blood all over the place. I never thought things like that happen in real life. Five meters around, splashes of blood. Some stains even led further from the spot. I was enchanted by it and wanted to go after it, but then my friend stopped me. The most experienced one said to go back slowly, and he even took his gun in his hand. He usually kept it at his thigh. 
not the hunting rifle. I got scared very fast because obviously it was not right. But that was nothing because then I saw a human hand ripping pieces mauled by big teeth. I noticed how my friend would look around and knowing him, I knew someone was watching. We went back very fast and the guys circled me for protection. I think the fact that my badass friends were so protective of me raised the biggest red flags for me because they're usually not this way. We tried to call the others but no signal and one of my friends made a fire with smoke. One hour passed and nothing. I knew they had to fire a couple of times in the air to signal them but somehow they were afraid to do it because according to my friend someone else could know where we are. Another friend replied, too late for that. They are close. At this point, I started to laugh because I thought they are pranking me until I heard something in the direction where we came from. They never explained anything to me, but from what I understood when they talked to each other, there was this vicious and smart pack of wolves that come from the mountains. Either Romania or Ukraine. Deforestation is a real problem in those countries, especially Romania, so many wild animals that disappeared in our country started to appear recently. They encountered this pack a while ago but thought they went back or scared them off. But apparently, they came back to the place where my friends usually gathered. The thing is, they're not afraid of firearms like common wolves in my country are. So basically, we couldn't reach our friends and according to the friends I was with, the pack went after them after tracking us. This is still illogical to me, but it was logically for them, so who am I to question them? This pack also attacks people, hungry or not, and even hunt people much more often than other animals. Last time they met the pack, they went after them for 50 kilometer until they reached their destination near water. They used their firearms on them, but nothing helped. Two of my friends decided to go after the others and warn them about the pack. Me and the friend that stayed left almost everything in the camp and basically went back home. My two friends also took a bare minimum and ran. It was midnight and still, no sign of my friends, not even a signal. The friend that was with me couldn't handle the pressure and equipped himself with grenades and army clothes and went to the camp in case if any of them came back. Later that night I saw his signaling fire at the camp. I tried to stay occupied and started to clean up when I hear howling, very close. I looked at the window that faces the forest and nothing. Then after the second howling, I realized they're near the house. Somehow they managed to jump the fence and they actually circled the house. They were walking in the circle. Someone called and I have to say, I was never so scared and happy in my entire life. Scared because I jumped when it rang. One of my friends were practically screaming in the phone to go in the basement and release the puppy. To say that I'm shocked is to say nothing. I couldn't understand a lot of things, he said, because the signal was bad also because he was screaming. They knew the pack is at the house and they were coming, but for some reason. I had to go in the basement to get some puppy. Honestly, I think subconsciously I knew what was going on, but at the time I was too scared to think. I found a baby wolf in the basement. My genius friends thought it's a good idea to bring in their house the baby of the wolf pack that killed people. I was never more angry at them than that time, and they have done stupid things before. The problem was that if I opened the door at the basement to release the puppy, the wolves could get me. So I decided to take it to the second floor and put in a basket or a smith and gently put it on the ground with a rope. I found everything I needed when I heard scratches on the door. The wolf mama wanted to get in, and honestly, if she knew how old the house is, she would just probably put her weight on the door, and then she would easily come inside. I went to the balcony and slowly started to get the basket down. The wolves were there, looking at me and all my moves. The she-wolf was easy to spot. She ran towards the puppy. I have to stay. The reunion was touching, but the wolves were only happy for five seconds. One of them even tried to jump at me. I was hypnotized. I watched them take the puppy and going where they came from. The she-wolf took the puppy in the teeth and dumped the fence. The rest of them jumped too, except one. He must have been the oldest. He had very smart eyes. 
He looked at me for a long time before he jumped too. I was scared and fascinated, and a couple of times when he went into the forest, he would look back, and honestly, it was the greatest thing ever. My friends came back a couple of hours after that, worried about me, but I told everything, and they were also shocked to hear about the behavior of these wolves, except one, the brother of the thief who took the puppy. He punched him right in the jaw and broke it. They didn't speak a couple of years after that. In the forest, they barely survived the pack. The only thing that saved them was the smelly bomb the brother had, not before he was bitten a couple of times. Other friends were attacked, too, until the two friends that were with me came to their rescue with fire. I know the story is incredible, and many will say it's fake, but God damn it, it's the best story of my life. And I don't care if people believe me. No one can take that from me. Also, I think since I don't know the whole story in many details, the story seems unreal. But I bet if one of my friends would tell, it would seem more real. Back when I was a high school senior, my buddy and I had a burning desire to ride our dirt bikes in solitude, far away from any disturbances. We ventured up an isolated logging road deep into an area of second growth, dug fur. After setting up camp in a clearing, our plan was to spend a couple of days immersed in this rugged wilderness. During the day, we tore up and down the local trails on our dirt bikes, relishing in the adrenaline-fueled joy of the ride. As dusk approached, signaling the end of our thrilling escapades, we made our way back to camp. However, our path was unexpectedly obstructed by a massive log deliberately placed across the trail. We knew for certain that this log hadn't been there earlier in the afternoon when we had zoomed past multiple times. Its deliberate positioning gave us an unsettling feeling. Considering the log's size, we didn't dare attempt to move it from the trail. Instead, we managed, with great effort, to maneuver our dirt bikes around the barrier. Unease and vulnerability crept into our consciousness, casting doubt on whether we should stay the night at the campsite. But fueled by Budweiser and bolstered by the fact that one of us had brought along his dad's 357 caliber, we made the decision to tough it out. Sleep evaded us throughout the night, so we built a substantial fire to ward off the darkness and its lurking uncertainties. However, around midnight, our feeble sense of security shattered. A massive rock came hurtling into our camp, followed by the cacophony of something colossal crashing through the undergrowth. The air was rent with otherworldly screams and growls, further unsettling our already frayed nerves. Another rock descended upon us, jolting us into immediate action. With hearts pounding, we sprinted towards our pickup truck and tore down the logging road, heading for the safety of all sea. In our haste, we left behind much of our camping gear, but we had the presence of mind to load our dirt bikes onto the truck earlier. The next day, in broad daylight, we returned to retrieve our abandoned belongings. Fear still lingered, preventing us from thoroughly investigating tracks or seeking other evidence. We hastily gathered what we could and made a swift departure from that eerie place. I live in Australia and I used to date this girl who lived in one of our national parks, a solid two-hour drive from anything. Anyway, one night it gets to like 2 a.m. and I've got to go home for some reason I can't remember. I'm driving along this pitch black road, no street lights, thick bush either side of the narrow road, a mess. I'm in a Land Rover Defender, for the uninformed, a fairly boxy car with a flat back. And a flat front, no curves. Anyway, I'm wigging myself out. It's a long drive and I'm prone to thinking of scary things. After about 30 minutes of driving, I look in my rear view mirror and see a silhouette of a person sitting in the back seat of the car. I am frozen with fear. Literally can't take my eyes off them. Can't stop driving. Can't move. About 30 seconds later and nothing happens. I move my arm up to move the mirror a little to see if I'm seeing things. And as I raise my arm, the person in the back waves at me. I freak out. What the fuck? 
A car appears from in front of me, driving the other way, and I'm thinking, yes, I'll flag this guy down and get rid of the offender or some shit. But when I look in the mirror again, the person is gone. The car flies past me. I look back, and the person is back again. I turn my head slowly, watching the mirror in. My periphery and the person slowly turns its head, too. God damn it, I'm scared. Finally, I slowly grab my jumper in the front seat to throw at the intruder, and in one big motion, I huck it backwards at the person so I could reef on the brakes and get out. Terrible plan, but I'm scared as... Anyway, I realize that the mother F in the back is my reflection off the back window of the car. The boxy shape meant my reflection looked perfectly like someone sitting in the back seat. Might be too late to respond, but one of my friends lives in an apartment complex next to a main road and some stores behind a gas station. It's an old complex and not in the middle of the woods or anything, but there are some back alleys and some trees nearby. Anyway, one night we were up playing Hearthstone or something, and we started hearing this really, really freaky noise. My friend keeps his windows open on the second floor to help with cooling the apartment. We both just kind of sit there, stunned, before I finally ask in a very low voice, What the F is that? It was like a cry, but like no animal had ever heard. Imagine like the freakiest zombie cry in a movie, and it sounded just like that, but loud and right outside. It persisted for about 20 minutes, and we just kind of stopped making noise and didn't do anything that would draw attention to us. Still have no idea what the hell it was. Mentioned it to my friend again just recently. I was fishing a lazy little river bend in southern Indiana one summer. I had ridden my motorcycle into the middle of nowhere, stopped to fish off of a little dirt road. A few hours later, I had wandered up and down the bank a good ways. I ended up getting pretty hung up in what appeared to be a decently deep area. After fighting the lion for a bit, I decided to cut the lion and my losses and call it a day. I took my knife and snipped the lion, started back up the bank towards the bike, and noticed a glint of something shinning in the water. I got closer, waited for the current to clear up a bit, and could make out a car bumper. I got down in the water a bit and could make out an old 70s-ish sedan sitting almost nose up in the water. Extremely intrigued, I decided to come back in a few days when the water cleared up. We had just got a decent amount of rain, so cloudy water conditions. I come back a few days later. Water cleared up well, and since it flows for a while over limestone, it was mostly clear. I could make out several cars down in the water. Two old sedans and a pickup. They'd been there for a very long time. Years, at least. I called the local DNR to report it. They said they'd send someone out to take a look. I end up in the area a few months later and just swing by out of blind wonder and the deep who was devoid of all cars. No telling what the hell the deal was. It did freak me out at first. Sorry for the rant. Lots of coffee, this, uh, I'm a... So just like that, something I couldn't see lifted the edge of my bed. I had my TV on a static channel, but had recently gotten in trouble for all my lights being on at night. I've always been afraid of what's in the dark. But my parents couldn't afford the light bill, so I knew I had to turn it off before I fell asleep. I finally got the guts to do so, and I nestle in under my covers to cower until I fall asleep. I'm drifting a little bit. Happy nothing scared me that night when all of a sudden the top right corner of my bed in relation to me lifts up a good foot and a half before falling back down, thumping me along with it. I had just a mattress cause I liked that sort of thing, just laying on the floor by the wall. They didn't lift it all, just the corner by my head. A oh, holes. I jump up so fast and ran to the living room. I checked on all my siblings, checked to hear if my mom and dad were sleeping, and everyone in the house was. I woke my parents reluctantly, but I was sobbing. 
They told me I could sleep in the living room, but I, I got the creeps in there worse. So I just broke the rules and went to bed with the lights on. But literally to this day, I am taken aback. The memory doesn't scare me. It's been a good 15 years, and I now threaten the things I can't see back like a crazy head, so they know I mean business, but it was so real. It happened, and I can't explain it from today's science. Had to be a ghosty or something. So this happened years ago, easily seven plus. I was hanging out late night or early morning with this chick I had been talking to. Throughout the night, we had been enjoying the night sky, looking at the moon, which was very high in the sky and just overall enjoying a beautiful summer night. It was around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and she decided to walk home, leaving me alone to smoke a cigarette before I left myself. As I smoked, I looked up at the eastern horizon and just above. The horizon line, I noticed what looked like a very dim, more dark planet. It was larger than the moon, probably 1.5 by the size of the moon, that I could still visibly see much higher in the sky. This dim, dark planet was moving very fast, as the sun and moon also do when rising or setting. It rose rapidly and disappeared in the darkness of the night sky. What could this have been? I don't think it was image refraction in the atmosphere, as the moon was so far away from this planet's position in the sky, and it was too early for the sun to even be close enough to cause anything like this to occur. I'm very curious to hear ideas on what this could have been. I like to explain things logically, and most things can be explained by everyday stuff. For example, Someone says that there's a ghostly knocking in their home. They're terrified of it, and it ends up being a loose pipe that knocks when the water is turned on and off. I have one of these pipes in my home. It's loud. So with that out of the way, I would like to share. This just happened to me about ten minutes ago or less, and I'm confused and slightly alarmed. I was getting ready for bed, and I like to sit and play on my phone before bed. The lights are all on, and I'm just sitting on my side with my phone in my hand. My boyfriend isn't there at the moment he was in the bathroom. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I see a bright yet small and focused beam of light coming from seemingly under his pillow at an angle coming towards me. I wasn't scared of it. It's a light. I have many items that create light. Headphones, his watch, my phone, and more. So I'm thinking, oh, he must forgot his watch in bed, and it made a weird light flash for a notification. Big problem, though. There's nothing under the pillow. I lifted it up and looked carefully as to not knock the thing out of the bed, whatever it may have been, and there's nothing. So I'm like, okay, maybe it rolled away, and I keep searching. I can't find the object or a source of this beam. The flash was only for a second, a full second. That wasn't super short, but it wasn't so fast that I could blame it on me imagining it. I was looking right at it, man. I saw the beam clear as day. It was so clear that I thought I must have left something in the bed, or maybe my boyfriend did. Clear as day, right in front of my eyes. I couldn't find a source. I removed all the pillows and felt around. There's nothing. My headphones are not in the bed. My boyfriend's watch is in the other room. My phone was in my hand. His phone was on the floor charging. WTF, I told him, and he was chill about it, and is now sleeping directly on the spot where the ghost light was so that makes one of us chill with it. I'm not scared of it. Maybe I am, but I'm more curious and want to get to the bottom of this. I don't know any more guys. It was right in front of me, clear as day. I don't know. It came from under the pillow, and there's nothing there. It happened in July of 2012 while I'm off with my boyfriend on vacation. He inherited a small house on an island in Brittany, France. It's called Isle de Grox. It's situated a few kilometers off the south coast of Brittany, and you can only get there with a ferry. 
It is pretty small and only a few inhabitants live there all year long. There's not much to do, but it's really beautiful and it's a nice place for quiet vacation. We like to go for rides during daytime as well as nighttime. Now, I'll start telling my story. 100% true. So one night, a clear night night doused in moonlight. It's important to remember that we went out around midnight for a ride on the island as we were used to do so. We headed to a beach whose name I can't remember that goes along a small family vacation village, VVF. Quick description of the area. The VVF is situated in a big curve bordered by a small road. Alongside the road is a strip of grass and sand. When standing on this strip, you have a really nice view of the beach and the sea which lie below. The road and village are situated on some kind of a steep cliff. To go down to the beach, you have to walk down sheer narrow stairs, situated a few meters away from where we were standing. Kay, my boyfriend, and I were standing by the road on the strip of sand grass since like ten minutes, looking down at the sea. I need to point out that it was a calm, clear night, and we hadn't seen anyone during our ride. We were walking along the beach for a while and hadn't noticed anything strange, nor signs of human presence on the beach. No night swimmers. The water is very cold in Brittany, even in the summer. No young people having a party on the beach, etc. So we were standing on a cliff, facing the sea, when suddenly, straight ahead of us, we saw a human-shaped figure get out of the water and hurry across the beach. I know, it's nothing scary so far. Except the figure was pitch black, contrasting with the clear sand, and was not reflecting any light, like a dark shadow. It's weird, cause, remember the moon was shining. We first thought it was someone skinny-dipping. Problem is, when you're going out of sea, you first swim to the edge of the sea, then you stand up and walk out of the water. This figure gradually went out, all the time standing tall as if it was walking on the bottom of the ocean. Moreover, Kay and I had been looking at the water for a while and never noticed anyone swimming, as if it was totally emerged for at least ten minutes. At the sight of that, I felt particularly uncomfortable, not to say really freaked out. So was my boyfriend, who is not easily scared. Weirdest part is once the human-shaped figure got out of the water, it headed straight ahead to the foot of the cliff where we were standing. But it wasn't walking or running. It was sliding on the sand, like really fast. A pitch-black human shape, with indistinguishable face and features, sliding fast as if on the sand, almost gliding, not moving its legs or anything, leaving no trail or footsteps behind all the time standing tall and human, shape, average human-sized and built. We stared at it silently until it got a few meters away from the foot of the cliff. Then, without talking, we decided to get the F out of Dodge, still with this feeling of dread and fear. We never saw or heard of this creature again, and nothing strange happened during the rest of our vacation. My boyfriend, however, has witnessed strange things on the island before but nothing that's related to this story. I've always been fascinated by Yellowstone National Park. The sprawling wilderness dotted with hot springs and geysers is like nowhere else on Earth. It's a place of natural beauty and wonder, but also a place of secrets and darkness. I was a park ranger in Yellowstone, tasked with ensuring the safety of all who entered its boundaries. One day I received a report of a missing camper. His friends had gone searching for him, but to no avail. It was my job to pick up the search and bring him back safely. As I ventured into the dense forests of the park, a sense of unease washed over me. The trees seemed to close in on me, blocking out the sunlight. I had a feeling that something was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I pushed on, following the trail left by the missing camper. The deeper I went, the more disturbing the sands became. Broken branches, shredded clothing, and pools of blood dotted the path. And then I found him. The missing camper was lying on the ground, his body torn apart by some unknown beast. The sight was enough to make me nauseous, but I knew I had to investigate further. That's when I heard it. 
The sound of footsteps, not human, but something else. Something big and dangerous. I turned around, my hand reaching for my weapon, but it was too late. The creature attacked, its jaws snapping at my flesh. I don't remember much after that. When I woke up, I was in an old cabin deep in the woods. I was being tended to by a woman who claimed to be a member of a secret religious order tasked with protecting the world from the supernatural. She told me that the creature that had attacked me was a werewolf, one of the many things that the government wanted to keep secret. The Secret Service was aware of the supernatural creatures roaming the park and had assigned her to protect the public from the truth. But as the days passed, I realized that the woman was not who she claimed to be. She was working for the very creatures she was supposed to be stopping, and her true intention was to use me as bait to draw more people into their grasp. I was horrified and scared, but I knew I had to escape. I made a break for it in the dead of night, but the werewolf was hot on my heels. I ran as fast as I could, but the creature caught up to me, its claws tearing into my flesh. I don't know how I managed to survive, but I did. I stumbled out of the woods, my body battered and broken. I was taken to the hospital, but I never fully recovered. I was forever scarred, both physically and mentally, by my experience in Yellowstone National Park. The Secret Service tried to cover up what had happened to me, but the truth leaked out. People began to whisper about the werewolves in the park, and the government was forced to admit to their existence. But for me, the truth came too late. I was forever changed by my encounter with the supernatural, and I could never shake the feeling that I was being watched. The end of my story is tragic, but the terror of what happened in Yellowstone National Park still lives on. The Appalachian Mountains rise tall and proud with their rugged peaks and dense forests that stretch as far as the eye can see. As a park ranger and a native of the area, I was no stranger to the beauty and majesty of the mountains. But even I was not prepared for what I encountered one fateful night. I received a distress call from my tribe who were residing deep within the Appalachian woods. They told me that something strange was happening in the forest and that they needed my help. I immediately set out to investigate, knowing that the safety of my tribe was at stake. As I approached the reservation, I was struck by the beauty of the forest. The towering trees loomed over me, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The sound of rustling leaves and rushing water filled the air, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and reverence for the land. But my sense of wonder was short-lived as I was patrolling the reservation. I was suddenly attacked by an unknown predator. It was a monster unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Its eyes were wild and its howls echoed through the forest. It was a wendigo, a spirit of the northern forests that was said to drive people mad with hunger. I fought back with all my strength, but the wendigo was too powerful. I managed to wound it, but it disappeared into the forest before I could finish it off. I was left confused and disoriented, struggling to make sense of what had just happened. Eventually, my tribe found me, and I told them what had transpired in the forest. They were shocked and frightened by my story, and they feared that the Wendigo would return. But I was determined to protect my tribe, and the next day I set out into the forest once again, this time armed with preparation. I knew that the conflict with the Wendigo was not over. But I was ready for the challenge. I knew that the safety of my tribe and the balance of the forest were at stake, and I was determined to put an end to the terror of the Wendigo once and for all. Again, as I entered the forest, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me. I knew that I was not alone, that my ancestors were with me, guiding me towards the Wendigo. The sound of rustling leaves grew louder, and out of nowhere he appeared in front of me. I soon found myself facing the monster once again. This time I was ready. I called upon the spirits of the land and reached for a twelve gauge. An exciting feeling surged through my body. The Wendigo howled in rage as it felt the bullet go through its thick skin. Unfortunately, it lunged at me with its razor-sharp claws. Our battle was intense and the forest shook with the fury of our fight. The Wendigo was strong, but I was stronger. 
I could feel the power of my ancestors flowing through me, and I knew that I was going to win. With one final bullet, I defeated the Wendigo, and he just turned over and ran. The forest grew quiet, and I felt a sense of peace settle over the land. The balance had been restored, and my tribe was safe once again. I returned to the reservation where my tribe was waiting for me. They welcomed me with open arms, and I could see the relief in their eyes. They knew that I had saved them from the Wendigo, and they were grateful. From that day on, I was known as the protector of the Appalachian woods, and my tribe held me in high esteem. I learned that the magic of the land was powerful, and that it was our duty to respect and protect it so that future generations could enjoy the beauty and majesty of the mountains. I am John, an African-American park ranger stationed in the remote mountains of the Appalachian Trail. My job was to patrol the vast wilderness and make sure that everyone who entered it, hiker, camper, or otherwise, was safe and secure. It was a warm summer day, and I was on my usual rounds when I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I was following a trail of broken branches and torn shrubs when I heard a loud roar in the distance. I thought it was a bear at first, but when I reached the source of the noise, I was faced with something far more terrifying. It was a Bigfoot, a massive bipedal creature covered in fur, standing at least ten feet tall. I had heard stories of these creatures before, but I'd never believed they were real, but there it was right in front of me and it was angry. I was frozen in fear, but I managed to draw my sidearm and take a shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch, and I soon realized that bullets were not going to be enough to stop it. The Bigfoot charged at me, and I ran as fast as I could. I stumbled upon a cave and crawled inside, hoping that the Bigfoot wouldn't be able to fit through the entrance. But to my horror, it was able to squeeze inside, and I was trapped. The Bigfoot began to tear through the cave looking for me, and I was running out of options. That's when I remembered the stories that my grandfather used to tell me about the Native American spirits that lived in these woods. I started to pray to them, begging for their help, and, and that's when I heard a voice. It was soft at first, but it grew louder and more insistent until it was a roar. The Bigfoot was thrown back from the cave entrance, and I was able to escape. I never saw the creature again, but I knew that it was still out there waiting for its next victim. I soon found out that there were other people in these woods and that they were searching for something. They were a secret service, investigating a series of strange and paranormal occurrences. They thought that I knew something and they started to follow me, always watching me, always waiting for me to slip up. I was in over my head and I didn't know who to trust. But I knew one thing for sure. I'm quitting my job. The pay is not worth the trouble if fighting various cryptids in woods. This takes place in March, April of 2013. Me and a friend had just been to the movies and was just walking around at 10.45 p.m. We decided we would take a shortcut through the skewer of our old school, which had since been abandoned and was in pretty bad shape. As we walked through the schoolyard, we decided to try to get inside the school building and explore a little bit. Now, the school consists of two wings, so the building is an L shape if viewed from above. It is three stories tall and has three entrances. The main entrance leads into a kind of main hall which connects the two wings. Each wing has staircases in each end of the corridors, which lead to the different floors. This is important later. One of the windows right by the entrance to the lower wing was actually wide open, so we could easily get in. We were now in the basement. We used our cell phones as flashlights and made sure not to point them towards the windows to avoid being seen. Even though the building was not in use, there was still a lot of stuff deaf just laying around. Musical equipment, uniforms, a pool table, chairs, etc. So we were just exploring each room in the basement to see if we could find anything cool. We explored the basement for about 15 minutes before we headed up to the first floor, and we were now in the main hall. 
There was some kind of tarp or large plastic sheet hanging there to separate the hall and the lower wing for some reason. I assume it was for some kind of construction work. We went down one of the corridors and started exploring the classrooms. Every classroom had been either vandalized or suffered some kind of water damage, so everything was pretty broken down and rotting. In hindsight, I think we were lucky the floors didn't collapse on us or something. We had just come out of the third classroom and were in the corridor when we heard someone moving the tarp, plastic sheet, in the main hall. This was not wind or anything. We could definitely tell someone was physically moving it. We could also hear footsteps, although the rhythm of the steps was kind of weird. It sounded like someone changed their walking pace sporadically, if that makes any sense. We immediately went inside a classroom to hide, as we thought someone had called security on us. We hid behind the door in the classroom for about two minutes, dead quiet. We didn't hear anything else during this time, so we figured it had to be the wind or just random noises. We decided to keep going. We went through the corridor and up the stairs in the other end from the main hall and explored the second floor. While we were there, we would occasionally hear some noises, but we just brushed it off as wind. After a while, we had explored the rest of the corridor and we decided to walk down the staircase that lead from the second floor to the hall. Halfway down the staircase, there was this plateau before the second set of stairs. And this is where things took a turn. No pun intended. We could see the plastic from there, and it was moving. We also heard some kind of scratching noise. We stood there for a second just listening, and I decided to peek around the corner to see what was making that sound. What I saw scared the living shit out of me. It was some kind of creature. It was skinny, almost completely naked. Couldn't see any clothes, at least. It really thin strands of hair and was really pale. Like corpse, pale, almost completely white. The first thing that came to mind was that this thing looked like Gollum, just bigger. It was crouching down and was scratching the floor or something, and it made some weird, growly, growly, grunny, breathy noises. It was facing away from us, so I just stood frozen for a good while and watched it. I took a step back and just pointed at this thing and looked at my friend. He peeked around the corner and immediately I could see his facial expression change into a combination of horror and shock. It was reassuring in a way, knowing that he saw it too. We just stood there for a good 20 seconds just watching this thing do whatever it was doing, and the most cliché horror movie thing happened. My friend started backing away slowly, and while doing so, stepped on a piece of glass that cracked. This startled the creature, and it quickly looked over, its shoulder right at me. I just bolted at that point. We ran all the way to the basement to get out, and the whole way there, I swear it felt like it was right behind us. We ran back to my friend's house, and when we got there, we had a kind of debriefing session, making sure we both saw the same thing. The closest thing to a reference picture I can find is this. It pretty much looked exactly like that, just with thin strands of hair on its head. I understand if you think I'm bullshitting, I would be skeptical if someone else told this story. But I swear this actually happened, and my friend confirms it to this day. We got a good enough look at it to confirm that it was a humanoid creature of some sorts, but it didn't really resemble a human being. The only explanation I can think of is that it was a homeless dude that for some reason was naked in this abandoned school. But this is in northern Norway during winter. You wouldn't survive very long without clothes. Also, I live in a very small town with very few, if any, homeless people, so the theory wouldn't really make sense. It could also be some kind of animal that had found its way inside, but we got a good look at it and it didn't resemble any animal I've seen before. I have no idea what that thing was. I am normally a rational, a cam's razor kind of person, but we saw what we saw and I have no explanation for it. When I was 19, I worked as a stalker for Target and had to bike to work early every morning around 4 a.m. Worst job ever. One morning, I got on the bike and began pedaling the five miles like usual. After a while, I got the weirdest feeling. I could feel that something was following me. 
I can't explain it any better than that. It was like a sixth sense. But here's the kicker. I could feel that whatever was following me from the air, behind me and up in the sky. My heartbeat quickened and I started pedaling faster. Movies were pouring through my head. Jeepers Creepers, Lost Boys, Interview with a Vampire. Any movie that has a scene in which something flies down and onto someone in a vehicle. At this point, I'm expecting my rational brain to kick in and do its, its usual thing any time I'm in a dark room or alone in an alley and relax me. It doesn't, and the feeling gets progressively more powerful. I am now sure that something is following me and is getting closer. I can remember my vision almost seemed to blur as my hearing became more crisp. My body was shifting gears from one sensory preset to another. My back felt as sensitive as my palms. Finally, I get the balls to look behind me. Nothing there. I keep pedaling faster and faster and faster. I look behind me again. There is something there. I, I can't tell what it is. It's dark. A hundred feet up and following me. Now I start to shit in my pants. I can remember being incoherent almost as if my body had shut down all higher functioning and replaced it with robotic movement. I remember thinking of Discovery Channel shows where the gazelle runs from the lion, and I know I'm the gazelle. I was simply waiting for whatever it was to land on me at this point. Me and my bike eventually burst into an empty but well-lit intersection and start heading down the hill to Target. The feeling lets up as suddenly as it seized me and I knew I was safe. I looked around me and up in the sky and everything was fine. Nothing there. I'm not sure what happened that morning eleven years ago, but as you can see, I remember almost every second of it. I was house-sitting for a friend in an ill-planned housing development out in the middle of nowhere. Everybody in the development had pooled their money and gone on a two-week cruise together. My friend didn't have cable yet, so I amused myself most nights by defending his refrigerator from a beer invasion. There was nobody for company but the one guy who had just moved in down the street and his great Dane-sized mixed-breed dog named Cujo, who hated me. Power went out one night, and we're standing in the road drinking the beer so it doesn't spoil. Any excuse, right? Talking about how spooky the place is only lit by moonlight when we hear a cougar. Two things you need to know about a cougar's roar. One, they sound exactly what you'd imagine a woman being tortured to death would sound like. And two, they sound like they're right behind you even if they're a mile away. Cujo's hackles rise, and he starts growling, staring off into the distance. More roars. I explain to the guy that it's a cougar. It's miles away, but the sound carries. That's a mating cry, and not a hunting cry, and nothing for Cujo to be afraid of, etc. This one literally sounds like it's ten feet away. Cujo cuts his head around, ends his growl with a little squeak, and stares at a spot right behind me. Right behind me. I very slowly turn around. Nothing is there. The cougar screams happen again, one far away and one that I swear is coming from the shadow of the house I'm looking at. I turn to the guy to suggest that maybe we want to go inside now. The guy and the dog were gone. In a few seconds they'd gone far enough to be out of sight on a gravel road without making any sound whatsoever. More screams. This time it seemed like both were coming from the shadows of the houses around me. I'm sure I broke some kind of land speed record getting back to my friend's house. Then I broke another record closing and locking all the windows. For the next hour or so, which seemed like a week, I heard screams from different places around the neighborhood. My beer, soaked mine, decided the cougars were trying to figure out which house I was in. When the scream stopped, I was convinced that they'd found me and were closing in. I very quietly started looking for the guns I knew my friend owned, but had hidden very well because he had children in the house. Every time I tried to lie down to go to sleep, I remembered my grandfather's stories about how the reason why cougars sound like a woman screaming is because they really are women screaming. They're humans trapped in cougar form by magic and pissed the hell off about it. 
Then I'd get up and look for the gun some more. I finally drifted off around dawn. I didn't see Cujo or the guy for the rest of my stay, but it turned out they were okay because my friend later mentioned that his daughters liked inviting them over and riding Cujo like a horse. In January 2019, I noticed something lumbering down my driveway. The window I was looking out faces over and above the drive, if that's clear. For example, I can see the roof of your car, but not always the bottom of the tire. Regardless, I notice movement. I look out and see what I initially thought was a bear, nose to the ground, kind of snuffling its head side to side, casually walking down the drive on all fours. A little geographical clarity. I live in town. The front of my neighborhood faces a major highway, but the back is all state game lands. I've seen some wildlife, turkeys, a deer here and there. In every skunk in the county apparently lives on my street. I don't see many squirrels, groundhogs, or chipmunks, which is a bit odd. I'm not very far from the city of Scranton. Enjoy office fans. About seven miles from downtown so I'm not exactly in the sticks. I watch this bear mosey down toward the street, its head lowered. I move from the living room window to my bedroom window that has a full view of the street. Sure enough, here it comes. But something is wrong. I watch this not bear stand on two legs and casually walk out into the road. I see pointed ears and a long snout. It's got its head raised, smelling the air. I felt pee run down my legs. This was no bear. I saw it in perfect silhouette under the yellow street light. It was either dark gray or black. The yellow light threw off the true color. It stood without effort, looked like one fluid movement. It then walked across the road, casual as you please, and kind of hunkered down in some scrub brush. I'm not sure what kind of brush, but it's like for Scythia, all tangled and thick. Then I realized it was looking right into my bedroom. It had blue eyes. I'm not sure if that was reflected light if they were glowing. It looked right at me. I lost my legs at that moment and sat down under my window. Absolutely panicked. I was home alone with five cats and a dog who slept through the whole thing. I didn't know what to do. My window is a big picture window. And if it wanted me, it easily could have gotten me. I cautiously got on my knees to peek over the sill and I lost it. Didn't see eyes or it anywhere. It seemed to be either moving away from the forest behind my house, or it decided to rest up in that scrub brush. What I saw under the streetlight is as follows. Darkish fur, high-pointed ears, long muzzle. I never saw teeth or if it had a tail. It had hands with long claws that hung kind of limp wrist. If they were fully extended, they would hang below the knee. It walked digitigrade on dog legs. It looked heavily muscled but had a tapered waist. It was about seven feet tall, judging from where it stood in relation to the streetlight. It was non-aggressive even when I felt it look right at me. I was terrified, but I didn't get a sense that it was pissed off it had been seen, as some people report. I didn't take a picture because I simply didn't think to. I was in a fair amount of shock, and I'm sure I'll eat shit for this, but sometimes your phone is the absolute last thing on your mind. The next day, I called Vic of Dogman Encounters Radio. His advice was solid, and I try and remember it when I have to go out at night. There have been some odd sounds tapping at my window. I can hear scratching of the siding. I don't see that many animals around the neighborhood. There used to be about seven stray cats I fed. All gone. Once the weather broke, it's been quiet. I installed motion lights and bought two game cameras. I'm hoping they are in a sense like Sasquatch. They avoid game cams. I don't ever want to see this thing again. Those of you who want to see one, pray you never do. My encounter was non-aggressive. I can't imagine having to deal with this thing pissed off. I still can't sleep a full night, and every sound scares the hell out of me after dark. I live alone, and the point three hundred fifty-seven I own would probably just ruffle its fur. Thank you for taking the time to read this. It was a terrifying animal to see. I hope I never see it again. But sadly, that wasn't in the cards. I'll post that story another time. I 
I and my husband were driving down Cabbage Patch, a narrow gravel road near Pine Thicket, looking for deer when husband said, what is that? I looked and said, what the heck is that? I saw a large brown object slightly bent over as if to pick up something. It raised straight upon two legs, had long arms, broad shoulders, and stood about seven to eight foot tall, very hairy. About that time it ran into the pine thicket with the speed of lighting. We were about twenty to thirty yards from it. We went back to the site the next morning, and we found a small footprint about eight inches long, and a big footprint about thirteen inches long in sight of where we seen it. We found some hair on a fence and metal poles that had been stepped on and bent over the fence was pulled up off the post and bottom fence all the way to the ground. We found a persimmon in the area that it was seen, and there was no persimmon tree nowhere around. The sightening was about 1.30 p.m. CST. It was about a one and a half a mile from my house. I grew up an only child in rural Pennsylvania. I used to sneak out of my bedroom and go hang out in our backyard on summer nights when I had trouble sleeping or woke up in the middle of the night. This was around ages six, eight, mid-90s. I'd go sit just below the top of the backyard hill where I was out of sight of our kitchen window. There were trees to the left with a wild open field across the rest of a mile-wide valley. We had a large hill with a bump in the middle that was perfect for sledding in the winter. Below that was a field with a deer trail cutting through the bottom of the hill, and a creek beyond at the center of the valley. On a clear night with a bright moon you could see across the valley I grew up in about a mile to where my best friend's house had their floodlights on all night behind their house. And when I say rural, I mean very rural Pennsylvania. Parent-teacher conferences were scheduled the first day of hunting season, and kids would often be out for a couple of days just for that. We had two houses in eye line of our house from that backyard. It was more than 30 miles to our nearest Walmart. I also grew up very familiar with deer, bear, rabbits, and even saw a mountain lion once while hiking with family. All of this to say I am familiar with wildlife there. The first night I saw Dogman was like any other. I was chilling in the grass, thrilled to just be doing something my parents didn't know about. I saw something moving quickly down along the deer trail. It was dark black against the rest of the night, partway through its path from the woods beside my house. It noticed me and stopped. We just stared at each other for what felt like a long time. It stood up and its ears were long enough to notice from a 100 yard or so distance. It was too thin to be a black bear, which I'd already seen a few times at that age. The staring continued for a long time. Eventually, it put its ears back down, put its front paws on the ground, and sprinted across the valley. I called it my werewolf because of the shape of it standing up. I don't think I ever told anybody. Like now, I loved having a secret. But after that first sighting, I went and sat outside a lot more. I remember once on a new moon I sat on the porch because I was too scared to go too far with how dark it was without the moon. I saw it three, four more times after that. It was usually running into the woods by my house, which were more than ten full acres owned just for hunting season. My werewolf never bothered me after that, but I remember I was really disappointed when it got cold outside, and I'd have to stop going out at night because I wouldn't see it. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.